Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, next talk, which is being given by Kat Harris, who will be presenting on a brief history of visual effects. Uh, big round of applause, please. Okay, hi everyone, uh, I'm Kat Harris, and I work in the visual effects industry, and I'm a bit sad about all this stuff. So, um, we should probably start right at the beginning. This is the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, it was made in 1895. It's a substitution effect, basically, you stop the camera while you're filming, you replace something in the scene, and then you start the camera again. It's a very basic sort of magic trick and it was made by Edison Labs in 1895. Bear in mind, I have half an hour to get from this, 1895, to this, which was last year's Oscar winner, uh, in half an hour. So, uh, yes, I'm going to be cherry picking a bit. I'm going to be specializing in certain things that I really like. This is obviously Star Trek. This isn't the same thing. So the substitution trick that we looked at just a minute ago uh, was sort of perfected by a guy called Georges Méliès. Um, he was trained as a stage magician and he created these incredible effects. Uh, he made over 500 films, over 200 of which we still have, um, and he's well worth looking up. Uh, he's just made this incredible collection of strange, weird, and wonderful things. Uh, this is A Journey to the Moon, and it was made in 1902. Uh, one of his earlier films um, uses another trick that I quite like to talk about, and that's this one, which is known as Four Troublesome Heads. <laughs> and it uses this amazing trick called matting, where basically when you're filming, you film through a plate of glass and you put a little square, little black square, where you want that head to go. Then you film everything you want, then you put the film back into your camera, film through a plate which is black except for the square, and then he stuck his head through the table and got an assistant to wave an arm when he waves an arm. It's, it requires incredible timing, incredible skill, but it works really well. And matting was used not only just as this sort of fun magic trick, but it was used for real films as well. This is The Great Train Robbery. Um, it was made in 1903. It's one of the first films to ever really have a story. Um, and the train outside the window is not actually there. They couldn't possibly film that in those days because film stock wasn't capable of dealing with the difference in light between inside and outside. So again, they've just painted out when they've filmed inside, they've painted out the window, and then they've taken the same film stock and filmed outside through glass where they've painted out the shape of the room. Um, now this is one trick. There's another trick, which is rear projection. Uh, this is King Kong, made in 1933, and in a minute, you're gonna see the woman appearing in this cave. And that is just, they filmed her early on, and projected it against a screen inside this tiny, tiny set. This is a miniature set. This is a full-size set, and they've done exactly the same thing, but they've projected it against a screen on the windows, uh, and you've got the giant stop-motion King Kong. Um, the next big problem you've got is this is great for static things, where you can paint a piece of glass, but as soon as you have something moving, this is going to fail horribly. So, the trick we use is called a traveling mat. The earliest kind, this is from Sunrise, Sunrise made in 1927, 1927. Um, and you film against black, and then you run your film through a process which exposes it onto more film, but you put loads of light through, so it brightens up, and then brightens up, and then brightens up, and then you have a shape, which is the shape of the characters you want to keep. You use that, and you expose your original backplate against this so that you get an outline. And then you put your original film back in. And that produces characters that can move. Now, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good for 1927. <laughs> um, 
Now, this was used in a lot of films, um, and one of my absolute favorites is The Invisible Man, uh, where <laughs> Claude Rains here is wearing a black velvet suit against a black background and dancing like an idiot and having a great time. <laughs> And this is one that is definitely worth watching. They actually use this technique even when better techniques were available because this was so popular. Um, now, this sort of, these sorts of techniques of matting were used for a very long time. You can't use them with colour, though. So at the beginning of colour film, they still had to use only placed mats. This is one of my favourites. It's um, the... Ah, sorry, The Ten Commandments, which was made in 1923. And they filmed this giant tank, 10 meter high tank of water, all cascading in, and then showed it flowing backwards for the background of the Red Sea parting. It's brilliant. And it's, it's one of the iconic film movement moments. Um, again, though, we're still stuck with backgrounds which nobody can interact with. Um, you, you got a lot of this, and you still get a lot of this, um, to make one of the most f sort of simple ways to make a really beautiful background is to paint it. And this, th this is The Wizard of Oz, and I can talk for a long time about The Wizard of Oz, but <laughs> uh, this was in Technicolor, uh, which is why the shoes are red, because red showed up really well instead of silver, like in the book. Um, this is a map painting. This is a picture that has been drawn on glass and is filmed in front of the camera while the set is below that shape. Um, this is a later uh, image of a guy called Peter Ellenshaw who painted some of the most beautiful pictures. But this is basically what it is. You just get a sheet of glass and you paint beautiful stuff on it. Um, and it was, it's used for absolutely years and years and years. Um, there are wonderful, wonderful films. Most of the films that you watch with beautiful sort of dramatic backdrops will have this in, and it's still used. Um, are we going to work? Yes. Uh, this is Guardians of the Galaxy. So any backgrounds here just come out of a department called digital matte painting, which does exactly the same thing, only it's digital. Um, all of the background clouds here are just a still image, some of which is sort of large and you can rotate around, but it's just a still image. Anything close is actually a 3D object, which I made. Um, <laughs> yay! Um, <laughs> so, we're moving on a little bit more, and what if you want to get characters that move? This is stop motion. This is Ray Harryhausen. If you haven't seen a film that Ray Harryhausen has had, had his grubby little mitts on, then please do. He makes some of the, made some of the most beautiful stop motion images known. This is Jason and the Argonauts, and um, it was made in 1963, and it, it still stands up because it looks beautiful. It doesn't look real, but it's beautiful. He spent four and a half months moving tiny bits of stuff uh, all by himself, because he was such a perfectionist, he wouldn't let anyone else work on it. So, we've got, all of, we've got all of this sort of amazing things that we can put together, but we still haven't really got a decent technology for putting people moving in a scene with other stuff. And there were a lot of early processes, but the best one was this one. And this is yellow screen. Um, what happened was sodium light is a very, very specific frequency. And so uh, an, an amazing guy called uh, Petro Vlahos built a prism which could split out the specific frequency of sodium light. So all of this was acted in front of a screen lit by the sodium light. And then it was run through the prism. All of the normal light went to the camera. And then all of the specific frequency sodium light went through to another camera and produced a really, really good outline. I mean, this is really flawless. Um, there was a, a downside to this, though, because they only made one prism. And it only made, worked with one size of film. 
Uh, and Disney owned it, and, and they weren't terribly nice about lending it out to people. So there were a bunch of other technologies. There was this one, uh, which was a really early blue screen, but if you're close enough to see it, he's got a great big blue outline around him. It doesn't really work that well. Finally, it got to Ben-Hur, which was going to be epic. It was going to be enormous. They wanted to have a really, really amazing technology. And it was on a bigger film stock than Disney liked. So they were stuck. Um, so they went back to Pietro Vlahos, and he invented this incredibly, wonderfully complex system, taking a blue screen and taking the blue and the green components and mixing them all up uh, in this magical machine called an optical printer. Um, and it, it would take me about 10 minutes to explain how this works, but it's wonderful and complicated. The reason they use a blue screen is because people are mainly sort of somewhere between pinky yellow and sort of brownie yellow. And so yellow is made up of green and red. Unless you're very, very pale skinned or very, very dark skinned, you don't tend to have a lot of blue in skin tones. So blue is the best background. And if you're using original film stocks, the blue tends to have the smallest grain. So that's why, that, that's why blue got used until very, very recently. And I'll go into why we use green now later. So we've got, we, we can put things on fr in front of each other. Uh, and that's amazing. But how about making some exciting sets? And I, we now get to 2001, and I could have done like half an hour on 2001. This, this is a set. This is a rotating giant set of giantness. It was amazing. Uh, they built this. And uh, this technique is still used today. It was used on Inception, uh, which is sort of ridiculous. For this scene, they used exactly the same kind of thing. Uh, Christopher Nolan is a bit of a crazy person. He did actually suspend a plane from another plane in Batman. Like, he, he loves those practical effects and budgets. So, <laughs> but yeah, 2001 uh, has amazing effect. This. This is my second favorite cheap effect. My absolute favorite is Terminator 2, where you've got a mirror scene with Sarah Connor doing work on uh, Terminator's brain. And uh, that's done by using Sarah Connor's twin. <laughs> like, the actress just has a twin, and they used her for the other side of the mirror. It's wonderful. This shot is done by having a pen on a bit of acetate just being moved in front of the camera. <laughs> and yet it looks so amazing. Um, this, of course, is the iconic ending. And this was done using an amazing technique called slit scan. Basically, it involves getting a large piece of um, sort of pattern, putting a slit in front of it, and then filming on a long exposure and panning backwards from that slit. So basically, you, you scan across very slowly a little bit of that shape, the, the sort of fun pattern. You then move the pattern on slightly and do it again. And it's really, really complicated. It's amazing. And I do suggest you look up how it's done, because slit scans Photography is dead now because you can, that sort of thing requires vast amounts of equipment. It's expensive, it's huge, and you can do this in about 10 minutes in After Effects now. So there's not much point building it. Things that I think are still built, worth building though are giant models. We don't so much, uh, which is very sad, but this is obviously Star Wars. Um, and it's just beautiful. Uh, most of these were built from bits of Airfix kits. Uh, if you look very carefully on a lot of sort of stuff from this era, uh, you'll notice lots of pipe work. And that pipe work is actually the sprues from the Airfix kits that they just stick on wherever they like. Um, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. All of the little laser flashes, certainly in the original, not in the uh, <coughs> remastered, um, uh, were just done using a process called rotoscoping. They're just drawn on. Uh, the original Ghostbusters uh, proton packs, just drawn on. Uh, very very time-consuming process, but it looks really good. Now, Star Wars, uh, you might not realize, was a very early pioneer of CGI. <laughs> um, 
This, uh, there was a little bit uh, in the Andromeda strain, which was in 1971, so it was a little bit earlier, but this uh, sequence of sort of how you enter the Death Star 101 is, uh, is some of the very earliest bits of film effects, and it took forever. Um, it's, it's sort of wonderful stuff, and I'll get onto um, computer stuff in a minute, but I want to go a little bit back to some of the joys of sort of the 1980s, the late 70s and 1980s, which was prosthetics. This is an American werewolf in London. Each, each shot of this is a separate prosthetic appliance. They took about half a day to apply and about four hours to remove afterwards. And it's incredible. He's sticking his head through a hole in the floor in this. <laughs> and this is hair pulled through rubber and then filmed backwards. It's, it's incredible, and the, the, the techniques in this are wonderful. And the next one is The Thing, which is also completely brilliant. It's gore, it's madness. <laughs> if you haven't seen this film, watch this film. It's, it's basically a masterpiece of uh, effects. The guy that worked on this essentially worked seven days a week, sort of... 14 hour days and eventually had to book himself into a hospital for exhaustion after he finished it uh, because it's just a film of bonkers things like this <laughs> I, you can just imagine the director going well I want his face to melt and then kind of be in half and then a tongue comes out and it grabs and it, the guy's just going okay <laughs> uh fine <laughs> um but yes it's beautiful so uh, there is a limit to what you can do with this, and we do end up getting into CGI, and obviously the first CGI film people think of is Tron. Tron is beautiful. Um, it was made in 1982, and uh, along with uh, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, uh, it was the first to feature really big CGI sequences. They were both denied, uh, they weren't even nominated for the Visual Effects Oscar in 1982, because apparently using computers is too easy. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, for reference, in 1984, there was, a, uh, th there was about 25 minutes of the, uh, the Last Starfighter, which is done in CGI. It's beautiful. It took two years to make on a Cray supercomputer. <laughs> so, uh, yes, it's not easy. Uh, and, and this is cutting edge. Um, this is the Star Trek Wrath of Khan, this is the Genesis sequence, which is all uh, very, very early CGI. I mean, this is, this is sort of people making things up from nowhere. There was not technology, there was not software to do this, and people just built it. Um, it took a little while for us to get actual CGI characters, but not very long. Um, in 1985, this is the young Sherlock Holmes, and this is the first CGI character that is not a bit in Tron. Um, and it's, it's really, really short, but it's really quite impressive. Um, but things moved on really quickly from there. This is The Abyss, uh, made in 1989, and it's the first sort of realistic looking water. Um, it's, again, it's a really sort of lovely, very cleverly crafted effect. Uh, You've then moved on to things like Terminator 2, my favorite, in 1991. You'll notice, though, that everything is very reflective. We can do reflective surfaces. We can't really, at this point, do anything that looks like skin convincingly. Um, it, took, it took another year in 92 uh, to get realistic-looking skin in, weirdly enough, in Death Becomes Her, uh, which is not known for its CGI. But it's in this sequence with the next, like, the next stretch. Again, this is a worth, film worth watching. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Some beautiful prosthetics again all the way through the film. But that stretch, that stretch was CGI skin, perfectly composited, so you don't really realize that it's there. So uh, we've, we've had uh, 1992, uh, but the big thing really happened in 1995 with Toy Story. Now, Toy Story was 
seminal. It was the first, there had been shorts, there had been sections of films that were made in CGI, but this was the first character-led story that was all CGI. Um, and we've had a lot of changes since then. It's worth bearing in mind that if you watch it now, it looks a bit pant because there are only about four different kinds of textures they could do. Uh, the shadows don't really work. We've got a lot of different technologies for making really good contact shadows and stuff. But, yeah, it, it still holds up as this amazing thing. Um, and, yeah, it's pff, over 20 years old. <laughs> oh, I feel so old. Right, um, yeah, so the, the next big one, probably in terms of CGI, was The Matrix. Oh, something happened. Did I knock the cable? Is it? Is it? <laughs> oh no, cables. Okay, so the matrix, <laughs> which I will try and show you in a minute. Okay, the matrix, which I will try and show you in a second, is, is awesome. Uh, but actually, th that's not the right one. Um, nope, that's not working. I'm so sorry, peeps. Okay, let's try this. Yes, the Matrix! Okay. Um, this is... This is one of the really big effects. A lot of stuff in the Matrix wasn't actually that new. Um, it was just used in really clever ways. So this was a rig of stills cameras placed in this amazing array and then triggered very, very carefully so that they all went... That, that basically, if you took the frame from each camera, it looked like normal footage. Beautiful. Um, but at the same time, this wasn't necessarily that new. Actually, some of the better new CGI is actually in the later films, which I don't really want to talk about because they're rubbish. But <laughs> the, the Agent Smith fight is actually really technologically exciting. So it's worth talking about why, why we've changed from blue to a green screen behind Neo in that, in that early shot. And that's because digital cameras work differently from film. Digital cameras have a shape that looks like this. And this means that you have twice as many green pixels as blue pixels, so you get much better definition. So you, you want to have the best definition possible in the thing you're going to try and take out because you want to be it, to, it to be as detailed as possible. So you can do incredible things like this, and this is uh, obviously the Martian. That stage with the, the red and green bits, that was rotoscoping. That was probably, probably some very poorly person, paid person in India. Uh, drawing round stuff. This does unfortunately get outsourced mainly to India still because it's cheap and it doesn't require that much skill. It just requires a lot of time. So, uh, green, we've, we've got green screen. We've actually reached the 2000s now. We've got new millennium stuff. And so I'm going to go with this as my first, first film of the new millennium. And it might seem weird, but actually it's because this was the advent of digital color grading. This is what it originally looked like. Beautiful, sort of summery day. They scanned the entire film into a computer and graded it to get this beautiful autumnal look. Um, and it's a really important thing. It's where all of, our, all of the hated teal and orange nonsense comes from now. But... <laughs> um, the color of films is incredibly important. It's, it's how you can really recognize a sort of after the 2000s film is because it's been digitally color graded. Um, another big thing that you'll notice in things after the 2000s is good oceans. This is the perfect storm. It's a tiny bit of the perfect storm. I can only find a tiny bit. Um, and this, is, this was a technology invented by ILM called FLIP, and it involves a really complicated system involving volumes and particles all interacting and sharing attributes, and it's very, very complicated, and I use it all the time, and I hate it. <laughs> um, but it produces beautiful water, and before that, you couldn't really do it. Uh, the other big CGI thing is crowds. 
Uh, crowds are sort of ubiquitous now, everywhere. You'll find them uh, in uh, the background of adverts with football matches. Like all of the crowds in those stadiums, any football, anything filmed in a football stadium with crowds in the background, in an advert, they're all digital. <laughs> they're all just made with the software called Massive, or there are some other ones that are similar. Um, and, but this involves taking loads and loads of little characters, giving them all attributes, and then telling them how to interact with each other. And it produces this incredible effect. Um, what have we got here? Ah, so this is the other one that is the big change. This is motion capture. Now, we had motion capture a lot earlier on, but this Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Man's Chest was the first one to use on-set motion capture. Because you've seen it with all the people with the little ping pong balls running around. Uh, basically, all that involves is you get a lot of cameras and they film all the ping pong balls and then a computer very carefully works out which ping pong ball is which from frame to frame. It then works out where they're supposed to be on your person and creates a skeleton. Uh, it's incredible. And it's even more incredible when it's done on set where you can't really put all of the cameras in sensible places. So this is, this is amazing tech. Uh, and it was taken one step further with Avatar, um, where the entire thing was motion captured. Uh, you, you've got all of these amazing facial motion captures where you've got uh, little witness cams taking pictures of everyone's faces um, they scanned everyone's faces so that they, they could create the most realistic looking weird aliens that look like the actors. Um, and it was really the first one to kind of beat the uncanny valley. They actually look like characters instead of weird things that are sort of human-ish. And that really gets us to sort of where we are now. Uh, this is gravity and it's utterly beautiful and it's definitely worth a watch if you haven't seen it. Um, the big thing with this was that we've gone the other way from motion capture. All of this was done in previs, which means it was done in a very simple way like you just saw. Um, it, so the entire film was essentially done with more or less computer game characters. They then knew exactly how everything was going to be lit and built a rig that put the actors into a lighting rig which was computer controlled. So they did all of their acting so that you get all of this amazing, realistic lighting on the actors so that it matches CGI around them, which is incredible. And yeah, so this is, this is, this is kind of where we are now. There's nothing that's hugely changing. We've got amazing characters uh, the character animation is really changing and really getting more beautiful. We've got things like uh, Groot and Rocket Raccoon. <gasps> Baby Groot is so cute. Um, yes, uh, but all of these things are, are sort of just taking what we've already been... Uh, back to all of the sort of very basic prosthetics of how humans move and just moving it on. Um, and that's, that's sort of more or less where we are today. Uh, I hope that's okay. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to take some. I don't know how much longer I've got. <laughs>